Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. And every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. When the sun shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. And every blessing, every blessing turn back to praise. And the darkness closes and Lord is still like us. morning. Good morning. All right, you may have a seat. It is good to see you guys this morning. Hey, church for us isn't just going through a routine or checking a box. For us, hey, it's it's coming together, fellowshipping with each other, worshiping together, and learning more about how we can apply God to our lives and in our hearts. And so, hey, we are glad to be here this morning, and we want to welcome you this morning. So if you're a guest of ours today here, we have a welcome card right in the seat in front of you. If you'll pick that up, fill that out so we can get to know you and put a gift in your hand at the end of service. If you're watching online, if you go to bfchurch.com, click on the guest tab. We kind of have the same thing, but we'd love to see you at some point here in house and worshiping with us. So right now, we'd love to meet you, greet you. So let's stand up. Let's walk around and welcome somebody.
All right. If you'll return to your chairs, you may have a seat. All right, guys. So in two Sundays from now, this is August 27th, we are having an ordination Sunday where we will be ordaining Pastor Juan as a pastor and two of his elders. And so that's going to be on August 27th. Yes. Hey, that, this, it's going to be a great time. And we'll also have a baptism that Sunday. And so we're working on setting up baptisms. If you're an adult here who's never been baptized, hey, come see us. We're also working on having some of our students from the camps who gave their life and and profess Christ as, as their Savior, working on that. And so, hey, if you're watching us online, you can watch us online. It's going to be great, but you're not going to get the same experiences if you're here. So we'd love to see you here on August 27th. Now, if you are a married, biblical married couple, would you raise your hand? All right, and if you're watching online, give us a thumbs up in the comment. Hey, if your hands are up or you gave us a thumbs up, we have a marriage retreat coming up that is for you. And so this is going to be on October 5th through 7th. You can register online today if you go to bfchurch.com, click on the uh, events tab, and, and the very first one is the marriage conference, the marriage retreat. And if you sign up before September 15th, you get the early bird price. Amen. So let me encourage you to, to go online today if you can or this week and get signed up so we can be expecting you. Right now, I'd like to, for us to stand up. We're going to pray, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now. Lord, I just pray for open hearts to receive your word. God, open minds that we can worship you. And it, it's not just a, a, a music service. God, but this be a worship time where we can prepare our hearts. God, we thank you for all that you're doing for this church body, for all that we're doing to, to honor you and bring more to know your name. Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, amen. You may be seated. All right. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for the praise band here. Amen. They prepare our hearts. So a lot's happened uh, since the last time I was up here preaching. Um, it's good to see that attendance is still here. People aren't, you know, exploring their options or anything like that. Um, but for those that are, you have until December 31st. So you now know. Um, so my moment of transparency, I'm really anxious right now. You know, um, not because of the whole transition, that of course, that, that, that's just anxiety at the, at the nth level. But, uh, you know, you get here, you have a plan, right? I get, so I get here in the morning, um, got here on about 637, uh, not 637, but 630 and 7. And uh, what I do is I come up and I stand when nobody else is here. I stand up here and I preach. And so that way I was like, okay, that's good. No, that's, you know, let's move some things around, stuff like that. So I did that and everything was fine. Then I, you know, I pray for y'all and then people start coming. And so we have our morning prayer meeting, which guys, if you're interested, uh, Mr. Ron and, and, and Philip and I meet back here at 930, you know, and we pray for the service. We pray for y'all. And so then, uh, now I'm really telling you how the sausage is made here. I get back there to the uh, uh, sound booth, and we have a couple of people out. And so, we, of course, we have a couple of people out. What's going to happen? Something's going to what? Go wrong. So some things, you know, weren't ready, weren't, weren't working, things like that. So we had to do some things. And thank you. Jennifer and Nikki, they're, they're holding it down back there. Um, and so, you know, we were doing stuff on the fly, and so the anxiety level started, right? So that, that happened, and then, you know, I'm just hearing the worship, just hearing the worship and, and trying to control my breathing. And then I'm going through my notes, and I'm like, oh, I need to say that. Oh, then this. And then I tell Jennifer, God's truth, Jennifer, 10 minutes ago, I said, I'm going to change my sermon. <laughs> well, I didn't change it, but I changed some things. So bear with me. It's all through the Holy Spirit anyway, but uh, let's, see, let's see if we can make some sense of it. Uh, and so I'd like to pray with us. Just pray for us this morning as we get started. Um, yes, I, we will probably run past 12, so I apologize now um, just because of, of the way things are. So if you've got to go to lunch, just, hey, I get it. Um, but let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now. We just thank you for just your grace and your mercy that mercy that is new every day, Father. I thank you that, that we have an opportunity to come before you, Father, that you are just intercessor, Father, that you intercede for us, Father, and you hear our petitions, Father. I pray for this service. I pray for the people that are here, either in person or listening online, Father. I even pray for me, Father, that we each hear a word from you today, Father, that we can apply in our lives, Father. I pray for those that don't know you, Father, that today be that day. Today be their birthday, Father. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so let's review 1 Peter. 1 Peter, when we last met, first we went through verses 1 and 2, and, and we talked about, I showed you this picture here, this painting of Rome burning, right? This happened circa AD 64. Nero had a plan. Uh, he started, and so he started a little fire in Rome, and then it got out of control, and he blamed the Christians, right? And then I talked to you about, I, I shared with you that there's a painting of Nero in the forefront kind of playing his harp. Y'all remember that? Well, I found that painting, and there it is. You can see Nero in the front looking over Rome, playing his harp like there is no problem. And in the, ba in the background there, in the, you can see Rome is burning, and so, because all along he had a plan to blame the Christians because he wanted to do something with that, that area of Rome. And so what better way to do it than first burn it and then blame somebody else for it. And so we talked about how the Christians had, a, they were facing political persecution. They were uh, uh, crucified they, because they didn't, they didn't uh, idolize or worship Nero, the Caesar, and how they were fed to lions. But not only was there political persecution, there was social persecution. Think about this. So Rome was polytheistic. 
meaning they worship many gods. They were so sensitive as not to offend any god that they created a statue named the unknown god. So to not offend, because they wanted to cover all their bases. Now you have these Christians coming and they're monotheistic, meaning they only worship and believe in one God. And so like, you only believe in one God. To believe in one God is basically not to believe in any God. So they're atheists. So the Romans thought Christians were atheists. Not only that, when we take the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, Jesus says this, take, eat, this is my body, drink, from this, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant. Now, one of the great things to, during the night, in nightlife in Rome, what people did was they would, what lesser people would do is they would look into the houses of the wealthy. And so they would look into their windows and they would see people talking and fellowshipping and things like that. And so you had these Romans passing by and these group of Christians inside this home are on the roof and they hear, eat my body, drink my blood. These Christians must be cannibals. So they were atheists, they were cannibals, and then we all have a term of endearment. Every Christian has a term of endearment. It's, that's my brother, that's my sister in the Lord, right? Well, you have these married couples calling each other brother and sister. Man, these Christians are incestuous. So they're incestuous, they're cannibals, and they're atheists. You don't think that would ostracize people socially, right? Well, also, to buy supplies, to buy goods, food, things like that, you would have to go to the Agora or the marketplace. Oftentimes, to enter into the Agora or the marketplace, you would have to burn incense to the God of that city or that town. And so you had to worship that God or that idol. Now you have these newly converted Christians who are faced with the dilemma, do I burn incense so I can feed my family? Or do I not and be ostracized? So that's a dilemma they were facing. Well, these Christians, these, these married couples had kids. Kids had to learn, so they went to the academies. What did they learn in the academies? These teachers were teaching them about all the gods in Rome. You have these newly converted Christians whose kids now believe in one God, who, who worship God, who, who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now they're going to school and learning about all these gods. You don't think that's indoctrination? Sound familiar? Right? And so these families had to make decisions, life-altering decisions that impacted them. So there was social persecution. And so in Peter's letter, he's, war he's letting them know, he's reminding them that this life is temporal. And three words that we looked at in verse 1 were aliens, scattered, and chosen. Peter lets them know that they are aliens. They are not from this world. They are not from here. We're just passing through. We're tourists. Then he says they're scattered. And we talked about that word scattered, how it's not haphazardly, it's not just randomly, but God selected and chose those people to be where they were at that specific time. And then chosen. God chose them. It says to the chosen who were scattered. God chose them. Then in verse two, we notice the presence of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he closes verse 2 with, May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. What a sweet ending to that verse. We'll see that again. We won't go through the entire book of, of 1 Peter, but I would ask that you go to 1 Peter 5, 12. 1 Peter 5, 12. When you get there, say amen. There you go, Miss. There you go, Miss Margaret. 1 Peter 5, 12, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So it bookends. 1, 2, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. 5, 12, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. In between those bookends, Peter 
repeatedly shares with us, with us that we are aliens, that we live differently, that we stand in the struggle. True grace, get this, true grace, the true grace of God is not the removal of struggles. True grace is when we are able to stand firm in the struggle. Now, that's a great bumper sticker, isn't it? That's a great bumper sticker. But how? How do we do that? How do we stand in the struggle? And so the key is perspective. Perspective. But not a perspective with our eyes. Perspective through kingdom eyes. It's that eternal perspective that oftentimes we lose hope in or we lose focus in. It's that eternal perspective. We have to see what God is doing around us and through us in the struggle. There was, I worked with a guy, and every time after we had a meeting, he would, he would end the meeting with this, onward through the fog. Get that? Because everything that we talked about, he is saying, was clear as mud. So onward through the fog. In our lives, don't we feel like we're going onward through the fog? But see, we're looking through our, our flesh, our, our earthly eyes. We're not, and we have our perspective, our fleshly perspective. But what we need to see is through eternal eyes, through, with that eternal perspective. We have to change our focus. Too many times we go chasing for what we see and we lose focus on eternity. So I'd ask that you stand as we honor the Lord with the reading of his word. We're going to be in 1 Peter uh, 1, verses 3 through 9, and this is God's word. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for, the, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though we have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Amen. And that's God's word. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Hey, Pastor Matt, can you turn the air down just a tad bit? Thank you, sir. I know y'all will be uncomfortable, but it is hot up here. And so Peter reminds us in verses 3 through 5 that when we, when we feel that all is lost, that hope is not lost. That we can go through life with trials and struggles and they'll come, but hope is still there. But so many times we lose hope. It's, it's oftentimes what? The first thing that we lose is hope. Like this morning, great illustration. We didn't have a, the song PowerPoint. Facebook wasn't working. Oh, great. All is lost. Cancel church. Right? It's like the first thing is hope. It's not pray. It's not God will provide. It's like call everybody, tell them to go home. Because things don't go our way. I want to look at verse 3, because in verse 3, verse 3 is powerful in so many ways. Verse 3 said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an explosion of praise, just that line right there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that, that, we look at that, but let's look at it in context. Who wrote that? Peter. We talked about last time Peter's life, right? How he denied Jesus. How he ran out. How he felt that he failed. And how Jesus 
reconciled, or, or he reconciled Peter back to the ministry. It had been 30 years since Jesus had rose from the grave, had victory over death. But Peter is writing like it happened that day. Pray, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is still fresh on Peter's mind. So my question to you, does it still do that for you today? Does the story still captivate you? Does it still motivate you? Does it determine how you live your life day in and day out? Does what Jesus did on the cross still drive you today? Or have you lost hope? Listen to the next line. Who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, it begins with great mercy, great mercy. That means it's beautiful, it's precious, it's undeserved. He caused us. The contemporary English version uses the word given. It was given. It wasn't earned. It wasn't purchased. It wasn't bartered. We didn't buy it. It was freely given. It's a gift from God. You see, this is God's divine initiative in our lives. He picked us. He chose us. We talked about it last, last time I was here, that he didn't pick us because we were special. He didn't pick, remember I used the illustration of, 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 of kickball? He didn't pick us because we kicked the ball the furthest. He didn't pick us because we were special. We are special because he picked us. And finally, born again, new life, new birth. Birth is brand new, brand new. It is the gift God gives us out of his great mercy. How many times have we thought, man, I wish I could do that over again. I wish I could go back to that one spot and start over. How many times have we ached and agonized over the pain that, that, of our past that we wish it could be wiped away? Well, in and with his great mercy, it can be wiped away. There it is. His great mercy has caused us to be born again. So great is the gift that is offered, it, it, but it, it also must be accepted. It can't, it's not forced or coerced. I was talking to a brother this past week, and, and I, I shared with him an illustration that was given to me years ago. You see, God is a just God. God is a loving God, but he's also the perfect gentleman. He will open the door for you, and he will wait for you to enter. He's not going to beg you to come in. He's not going to tell you to come in. He's not going to trick you to come in. He's going to wait patiently for you to make the choice to come in. Because he chose you. He chose all of us. But he's waiting patiently for you to enter and accept the free gift. You see, you and I are free to accept or reject the offer. And I just think about any parent here, I'm sure, say, shares in the same pain and agony that I do, that Sophia and I do, is we want our kids to learn from what? Our mistakes, don't we? We so much want them to learn from our mistakes. And the older they get, it, it, it's a balancing act. Because I can tell them when they're young, do this, do that, do this, right? We could tell them. But when they get older, it's more suggestive. Hey, if I were you, maybe consider this. Just, and, and when they choose what we deem is wrong or they make a wrong choice or a choice that, you know, hey, I've done that. It didn't work out. Just learn from my mistakes. But they still choose to walk that step, that walk that down that, that valley. The pain that we feel, right, as parents. Think about how God feels when we choose to reject his son knowing full well what Jesus offers. But he's the perfect gentleman. See, Peter reminds those chosen aliens that were scattered that God has graciously provided for their redemption through the sacrifice of his son. He loved them enough to allow Jesus, his only begotten son, to die in their place. 
Peter reminds them that God's love was not, not, that is not to be marginalized. It is not to be forgotten. In our walk as Christians, we know that we're Christians, we call ourselves Christians, but we forget what Jesus did on the cross for us. We forget the blood sacrifice that was paid for, for my sin. We walk around like it's a badge of honor. I was listening to this guy on podcast. He's, he put it this way. He said, it's Christianity, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't subscribe to this, but he said, being a Receiving, having Jesus in your heart is like having a ticket to the club. It's being in dress code. That's all you need to do. I can do whatever I want now because I got a ticket into the club. He forgot about, first of all, he's not saved, right? Second of all, he forgot about the blood sacrifice. He forgot that we are called to, we are not of this world. And so that's what Peter was reminding these five churches. You are not from here. Don't act like them. Be set apart. Be that city on the hill. You see, they were loved by God. He knew where they were in their journey. And he was more than able to provide for their needs so that they could endure. Their hope wasn't in the abilities and, or, and policies of man. Their hope wasn't in the things of the earth. Their hope was in Jesus. The Romans threatened them. The Romans martyred them. But even in death, hope remained. We need to remember our source of hope. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in those around us. It's not in the government. It's not in Congress. It's not in the president. Although every four years, people think that's where our hope is. It's not in those things. Our hope is not in the stock market. Our hope is not in our jobs. It's not in our paycheck. Our hope is not even in our spouse. Amen. See, hope is not given by earthly means. Nothing we face in this life can remove or diminish our hope because we are born again to a living hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ. You see, Christ faced death. He gave his life at Calvary. They placed him in the tomb. They rolled the stone. And three days later, he Life, his life was, he came, came forward triumphant. Christ died for our sins and conquered death. You see, that early church, their hope wasn't in one who had been, their hope in the one who is. What comfort and joy that brings to me and it should to you as well that we don't know what we will face in the future, but I know that this life is temporal. Now, I know that's hard to hear for a lot of people that this life is temporal. Yes, we are all going to die. And yeah, you might be going through things right now, and I'm not minimizing what you're going through. Life is tough. I get it. And I'm not minimizing it. But don't minimize eternity either. Don't minimize hope. Sometimes we, we make our, our, rea our reality here on earth bigger than hope. We make our issues bigger than God. We make our, our, our issues, our struggles, our, our problems bigger than the one who can solve those things. You see, regardless of the cause of death that, that, that we will all succumb to, I know that I'm secure in Christ, that he conquered death, and through him I have the assurance of eternal life. The same, same thing goes for the church. You see, we have a promise, the promise of life in Christ, that he will come again for his bride. And when he does, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive will re and remain will be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. That's a great promise and a great illustration of God's love, of that reunion that we will have. So let me talk about hope for a minute. When Jerome Grootman diagnosed patients with serious diseases and illnesses, he discovered that all of them were looking for a sense of genuine hope. And indeed, that hope was as important to them as anything he might prescribe as a physician. He wrote this book called The Anatomy of Hope, and he was asked to define what hope meant. And he said this, he said, basically, I think hope is the ability to see a path to the future. You are facing dire circumstances, and you need to know everything that's blocking or threatening you. 
and then you see a path or a potential path to get to where you want to be. Once you see that, there's a tremendous emotional uplift that occurs. Now he's talking about hope here. What a great, what a great definition of eternal hope. As a lost person, if you're reading, if you're hearing this and you're hoping, how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this situation? How do I get out of this? How do, how do I know, you know, all the questions that we get asked, there is hope, not happenstance, not circumstance, but a living hope in Jesus Christ. The doctor confessed, I think hope has been, is, and always will be at the heart of medicine and healing. We could not live without hope. Amen. We cannot, as Christians, live without Jesus, who is our hope. He says, we still come back to this profound human need to believe that there is a possibility to reach a future that is better than the one in the present. That is the living hope we have in Christ. Uh, Titus 2.13 says this. He says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. That is living hope. And in that hope, we have two things, splendor and security. That's what we find in hope. The splendor of hope and the security in hope. And so let's look at the, the splendor in our hope. 1 Peter 4 says, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Peter reminds them not only of their hope of the resurrection, but also of the hope of eternity in heaven. All the issues that we deal with, all the struggles we deal with in our, in our life, they're not forever. They're not. Yes, you might have a, a, a disability that you've had your, your, your entire life here on earth, but it's not for eternity. You might be going through a, a, a nasty divorce or, or, or you might have to suffer job loss, financial issues, bankruptcy, whatever it is. It might be life altering here, but it's not eternity altering because our hope still lies in Jesus. You see, Jesus conquered death and now he stands as mediator. He is preparing a place for us to join him in the splendors of heaven. In my five years here, I don't wanna say it's my privilege, but I've been asked to officiate uh, loved ones' funerals. And that's a, that's a very sensitive time in, in people's lives. Um, because they, you know, of course, the loss of their loved one, the pain, the suffering, the, sometimes the loss of hope, the I don't know, the, 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 the wants, the whys, the hows, they want all those things answered. And so one of the scripture verses that I use to provide that hope is John 14, verses one through three. Because it's a great reminder of the hope that we have in Jesus because it promises, it, 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 it's hope in three different ways. Let me, let me read it to you. John 14, verses one through three. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. See, Jesus speaks to the hope of a residence. He goes to prepare a place for us, a place for us to live for all eternity. You don't think that's hope? There, there's hope. When we cease to exist on this side of heaven, we already got a house on the other side. Grass is cut, house is clean, right? That's hope. Then there's the hope of redemption the redemption of his promise that where he goes, that he goes to prepare a place. And if it were not so, he would have told us so. And then there's the hope of reunion because where I go, you go. And we will be together again, the reunion of the body of Christ. See, that's hope. 
That's what Jesus was talking about in John, and that's what Peter is talking about now. This is where we find hope. I'm sure that, that we each have experiences um, that, that make life difficult, but nothing compares to, nothing can, can, can take us away from what God and Jesus, God has promised us. You know, this life is difficult again, but home, the home that awaits us will be like anything that we've ever experienced on this side of heaven. It is glorious in all its splendor. You see, because our inheritance is un- will be uncorruptible. That means it cannot perish. It does not age. It does not te- deteriorate. We don't need to get a new roof in 20 years. We don't need to get a new AC when it goes out. It does not have the seed of corruption within it. It's undefiled. It cannot be polluted, dirtied, infected. It means that our inheritance will be without any flaw or defect. It will be perfectly free from sickness, disease, infections, accident, pollution, dirt, from any defilement whatsoever. That's the hope that we have. That's the promise that we have. That's the splendor, that the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Also, this inheritance will never fade away. The beautiful part is we will never have to say goodbye ever again. Colossians 3, 4 says this, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Verse five speaks to our, the security we have in hope, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, the new King James Version uses kept, who are kept by the power of God through faith. That word kept. So there was a, an, an Irish um, businessman, wealthy guy, and so he was getting ready to die, so he was making preparations for his funeral. And they said, okay, what do you want on your tombstone? Do you want, you know, husband, you know, father, friend, millionaire, whatever, whatever. He was like, I want one word, kept. What a powerful word, kept. When we are in Jesus, we are kept. We are kept in his hand. And nothing, nothing can take us away from his hand because we are kept. We are kept in his hands. We are kept in his arms. We are kept in his love. J. Vernon McGee says this, the only way in the world that you can live the Christian life is by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the fact that you are kept by the power of God right on through until the day when you will be delivered to him in heaven. We cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. We cannot. 1 John 3, 2, let me go back. These, this early church, these early Christians, the only thing certain in their lives was uncertainty. But Peter wanted to remind them this, the security they had in their future, that it's unchangeable. They had been saved by the grace of God, placed it within the body of Christ, and were slated for heaven. When their race on this earth was complete, they would spend eternity in heaven. You see... We need to be reminded of that from time to time, that our lives here will not last forever. Death is coming, but that we will not be, that will not be the final moment of our existence because we are kept by the power of God. We're simply waiting. We're waiting to make the transition from this life to the next, but it's what you do with it. You know, because there was, I think Paul wrote uh, the church in Corinth. He, he said, you know, if you, you, you can't just sit, because there was a, a thought that, you know, hey, I'm saved now, so let me sit back and just wait. And that's why Paul had to warn him, hey, you don't eat, you don't work, you don't eat. So just because we're saved, it's not like, okay, I can't do any other thing because I'll lose my salvation. I won't get into heaven. No, once you're kept, you're kept. But you still got to work for the Lord. Works don't get you into heaven, but we work for God because we love God because what he did for us, Right? 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. There you go. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Peter reminds them that along with their hope in the Lord, that there is help with him as well. Difficult times will come, but remember, he is with us. 
to endure in hope. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. That gives us perspective. That gives us eternal perspective that he is with us. We are never the lone ranger in our life. We are never alone in the things that we do or the, or, or, or the struggles that we face on this earth. And when we think we're all alone, we, talk, we just got done with Elijah. Elijah thought he was alone. He was poor, pitiful. He was playing the whole poor, pitiful me party, and he was not alone. In the same way, Peter is telling us now, you are never alone. So, football season's coming up. And for those of you that know, know that I love the Dallas Cowboys. Amen. Well, every, I, I usually, when they play the early games, I don't usually get to watch the games because we're busy, so I record them. And I usually find out the outcome of the game um, before I actually watch it. But I still watch it. I know when the Cowboys win. I know when the Cowboys lose. But when I watch it, Especially when they're losing, I'm like, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? And so I, my, my emotions get involved. Even though I know the outcome, I still get caught up in the emotion. I still get caught up, you know, getting mad and angry. Like, what are they doing? Well, they're losing. They lost, right? We do that in our life. Hey, read the book. We win. But we go through life, think we, we forget we forget the outcome. We, 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 we lose eternal perspective and we think of the moment. You see, we can't, we can't think that way. We can't be that way. We can't have that kind of perspective because then we minimize who God is in our life. We minimize the victory that Jesus has over death. And we struggle. I and mean, we're going to struggle anyway, but we really struggle. We isolate ourselves. We stop going to church. We stop fellowshipping. We stop reading. We stop devoting time and prayer to God because it's just, it's all lost. Slides don't work. Facebook doesn't work. We lose focus, don't we? See, we can't lose perspective. God has a purpose in our struggles. He is doing something in us and through us. Our lives should be distinct from others. Because we gotta remember what? Who we are, we are aliens. So Congress recently had a hearing on UFOs and aliens. Did y'all watch that on C-SPAN or catch Twitter updates or whatever? How you had congressmen saying, so, so-and-so, our UFOs, do they exist? Is there such thing as aliens? Hey, ask a pastor. That's all you got to do is ask a pastor. Ask a Christian. We've been, that, we've been down here for 2,000 years. We are aliens, amen? We exist. But we shy away. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to offend you. Oh, there's a, there might be other ways to heaven. Oh, there could be more than one God. There's not. The only hope, the living hope, can only be found in Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Peter reminds them to keep proper perspective in their struggles. Because when those times come, they will be encouraged to look at them through the lens of faith. We need to take off our fleshly glasses and put on our eternal glasses and see, see it through that lens. See, we got to anticipate the eternity, spending eternity with Jesus. And that, that, that anticipation, that should outweigh any obstacle and overcome any struggle that we face. Because struggles will remain in this, as long as we exist in this flesh, struggles will come. But what we do so many times in our lives, we allow the struggles, we allow the trials, we allow the tribulations, we, we allow those things to defeat us. Instead of, instead of, instead of letting, you know, standing, hey, 10 toes down and standing firm. No, I have victory in Christ. But we let, def we let 
The struggles defeat us. We cower to those things. We got to keep our focus on the Lord, anticipating our eternal future with him. James 1, 2 says this, Consider it all joy, my brethren, that when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Easy to say, hard to do. But let me let you know, let you in on something here. That's why we have each other. That's why we have lift group. That's why we have the prayer line. That's why we have Wednesday night. That's why we have Sunday morning. That's why we have Sunday night. That's why we have Awanas. That's why we have youth. That's why we have kids. That's why we have women's Bible studies. That's why we have men's Bible studies. That's why we have each other. So that when these things happen, we can count it joy because I have a foundation first in Christ, but in the body of Christ as this church to support each other. In verse 7, Peter does not suggest that their trials be enjoyable, will be enjoyable, but they are beneficial for our Christian walk, and they'll be more precious than gold. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by faith, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. How many times, and be honest, you're in church, in your struggle, have you said, man, I'm so glad that this is happening to me. I think I'm going to do this again next week. But that's where we find joy. Because we, again, keep per eternal perspective. God is doing something in and through you, through the struggle. He is refining you. You see, as they endured the, endured the trials, of, man, I got lazy there. As they endured the trials of life, God was refining them, removing the doubts and failures while conforming them to the image of Christ. You see, their faithfulness to Christ in the midst of these adversities would only strengthen them in their faith and bring honor and glory to God. Nothing speaks louder to unbelievers than a Christian who stands in the struggle. Nothing speaks louder to the lost than us praising God in, in the times of, of struggle, in the times of adversity. But so many times, that's when we're silent, is we don't want to say anything. We isolate ourselves. We alienate ourselves. And, or, or we complain. Don't we? Don't we do that? We complain about our circumstance instead of praising God. You see, God refines us in the storms. It is during those times that we need to lean in and trust the Lord and become more like him. Because our lives are a living testimony of what Christ has done and continues to do. I know for me, I don't enjoy trials, but if they serve to draw me closer, I don't like them, but I will endure them in Christ. You see, we need to lean into struggles. So uh, you want to talk about somebody that struggled, we could talk about Job, and you know, that, that's its own thing. He's his own, I mean, that, that's a, you know, a character, a, a, a whole story and a study on what it means to per persevere and endure to, through, tr through trials. And so Job 23.10 says, but he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. To have that kind of eternal perspective. I mean, you had his friends, his wife, deny, cry, deny God, turn away from God. As, pray as if you were never born. No, I stand. Like I said, 10 toes. Romans 8, 38, 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will set, be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I'm not saying go look for struggles. But don't shy away from struggles either, because remember, true grace is not the removal of struggles. It's being able to stand in them. And that's where we find our patience. We find our patience through faith. Let's look at verse 8 real quick. 
real quick. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You greatly rejoice with your joy, inex with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Their love for Christ would provide the help they needed to endure whatever they needed because they had eternal perspective. You see, one day their faith would end in sight, just like ours. One day our faith will end in sight where we will see him. We will stand face to face with God. You see, as we continue to do, do this thing called life and, 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 and ebbs and flows of life, hills and valleys, mountains and depths, know that there is a home waiting for you. So why abandon your faith? Why do we abandon our faith? Why do we consider giving up on the Lord when we have the promises of God? You see, one day we will enter into the presence of the Lord, the one who died for our sins, purchasing us. And we will spend eternity praising him in the glories. So when you look at, if you, if you look at it, right, in, in its totality, what in your life, and, and, and again, I'm not minimizing what's going on in your life with, with health or jobs or, or relationships. I'm not minimizing that because we're here to help, we're here to pray with you and stand with you and walk through this thing with life with you. But what on this, what, what is so big on this side of heaven that will make you lose focus of eternity and the promises that we have that of a place to live, of a home, a dwelling, that we get to spend eternity with, G, with God. And believe me, I get it. Patience is not my best character trait, but I do patiently wait for the Lord. Because sometimes we get impatient, don't we? Sometimes we lose focus because we want, we want, we want. Sometimes it's just waiting. Again, we chase things because it's shiny. We chase things because we feel we need to fix it or do something. God, you know, there's people that have that mentality of fix it. I hear there's a problem, let me fix it. Sometimes we don't need to fix it. Pastor Joe gave me some great wisdom one time. He said, you know, not every need is a calling. Not every need is a calling. So sometimes we just need to wait patiently on the Lord. Let's look at verse nine, let's close it out. This is what Peter writes, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's the reward of our faith. Not freedom or removal of struggles, but salvation of our souls. It's not to get in the club. The reward is heaven. The reward is eternity. And that's what Peter is reminding these early churches, is to wait patiently, to endure patiently, learning from your struggles, but staying firm in them. Amen? Man, I'm going to ask the band to come up at this time. I hope everyone here stays key hold focus on Jesus. Because we will all face struggles in our lives. And, and, and again, some of y'all are experiencing those things right now. And the enemy would have you believe that all hope is gone, that the only hope you could find is what you create yourself. That is wrong, that is flawed. Because the only hope that we can have is in Jesus Christ. You see, we got to be reminded to continue to press on. We have to be reminded that our hope is not in this world, but in Jesus Christ. And he is able to equip us and to, so that we can stand in the struggles that we face down here. And if you're struggling today, let me speak to you for a moment. And for those that will face struggles, because it's kind of like valleys. You're either in one, out of one, or get ready to go in one, right? Why not come and seek the Lord to renew your hope and provide the help that you need to press, to continue to press on today? Because he will meet you where you are. He will provide every need that you have. 
For those of you that are not saved, the promises that, that I spoke about in John 14, where he says, if I go to prepare, I go to prepare a place for you. If, I, if it were not true, I would have told you so. That where I am, you will be also. If you are not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, that promise is not for you. You don't have the promise of, of a reunion. You don't have the promise of redemption. You don't have a promise of a residence. You are lost. This is the best of heaven you're going to get today. This is your heaven if you don't know Christ. Because to be unsaved, to not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, is to be in total opposition to Jesus. But again, he is the perfect gentleman. He will let you make the, your eternal decision. Seal it today. Stand in the struggle. Because we will all struggle. But for those of us that know Christ, we have victory. All you know is defeat. So accept, redeem those promises that when you no longer are here on this earth, you can spend eternity in heaven. I'm gonna ask you to stand at this time. For those that are Christians that maybe are, have, have let have let your struggle, have let the trials, let the, the, the temptations, let, let those things take over your focus, have, have, have taken your, those th your eyes off of Jesus and, and, and made you look more to the issues at hand. Remember whose you are. Remember who keeps you. Remember that you have a promise that he will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's in the valley. That is in the struggle. He knows your name. Praise his name in the valley. Shout for joy in those times of need and struggle because he is there with you. Christian, I ask that you pray for Pray for those that don't know Jesus. Pray for those that have walked away, but continue to pray for yourself and others because we don't want our, where our standing to be an idol. We don't want us saying, well, I'm a Christian to usurp what God is doing. Don't wear a Christian as a badge of honor, but as a privilege to praise his name. So as the band plays, if you don't know Christ this morning, I'm going to have Pastor Matt down here. I'm going to ask Mr. Jimmy to come down here. Uh, uh, we will line up up here. And if you don't know Christ, make today your birthday. If you've walked away from him, come back home. If you feel like the Lord is calling you to, to worship here and be a member of Believer's Fellowship, now is the time to come. If you visited and you feel like this is where God is calling you, come. Answer the call. Do what God is calling you to do. If there's a ministry that you've been praying about or God has put on your heart, why are you waiting? So many times we say, I'm waiting on a sign. I'm waiting on the Lord. Lord is, the God is talking. But are you doing? And so let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now. Father, we thank you, Father. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. We thank you for the hope that we found, that it can be found in Jesus Christ, Father. Father, I pray for those that don't know you, Father. I pray that you have been ministering to them, Father. I pray that you have been speaking to them through me like I'm reading their mail, Father. Father, I pray, Father, that they are just come to a place of brokenness right now, Father. That today be that day, Father, where they accept you, Father, as the Lord and Savior, turning from their sin, Father, asking for forgiveness, Father. I pray for those that have walked away, Father, that have been more focused on their issues instead of you, Father. I pray that you give them eternal perspective, Father. Give them the strength, Father, to stand in the struggle, Father. And I pray for all of us, Father, that we not become jaded, by Father, because we are, we've been Christian for 10 years, 20 years, 10 months, 5 months, whatever, Father. Because, Father, struggles will come, Father. We can only get through them because of you, Father. Father, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to, to share my heart. Um, amen, amen. Um, so I did bring the kids down here. I don't know if y'all know, school starts Wednesday. And so we're going to be praying for our, our students and our youth. But I got a couple of closing announcements. Um, so I got a secret. Let's see how many people keep this. Um, for those of you that know, no. Um, September, oh, I'm sorry, August 18th. Can you, you can't see that. I can't see that. Yeah, there it is. August 18th at 7 o'clock here at the Spring Campus. We're going to have a surprise birthday party for Miss Kathy. She turns, I'm not going to say it. So, nope, nope, not doing it, not doing it, nope. Uh, so we're going to have a surprise birthday party for here, here at the church uh, in the fellowship hall for Miss Kathy. Uh, Camille, Angela, Sophia, get with them uh, if, for, everything, for, for anything and everything. Um, I am not on that committee. That is not my ministry. Um, still waiting on the Lord on that one. Um, so get with them regarding that. Um, and this is not on the slide, but before people make plans, September 8th at the Magnolia campus, 7 o'clock, um, the camp is the, is the leadership meeting. If you, serve in, if you serve in the church in any type of ministry or a leader in the ministry, volunteer in the ministry, um, the leadership meeting is at the Magnolia campus this year. It's our annual leadership meeting. September 8th at the Magnolia campus at 7 o'clock. It's not a dinner. It's going to be a dessert fellowship, I think. And, and so I need uh, somebody, I need five somebodies to uh, bring a dessert. And so if you can make a dessert, let me know. And so that, because I need five, minimum five. If you want to bring more, that's fine. But campus leadership meeting, 7 o'clock, September 8th at the Magnolia campus. For our guests and online viewers, there's a welcome card if you're here. Uh, in the seat back, as you fill that out at the end of service, we'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hands. If you're joining us online, let us know. Reach out to us uh, via Facebook. And don't forget your tithes and offerings, three ways to give. Of course, you can see it behind me. Uh, got two announcements, last announcements. For those of you who, who at, were wondering where I went, to, uh, Ms. Pansy, a longstanding member, will be moving to with her son in, to Kansas at the end of the month. And so, Ms. Pansy, know we're praying for you. We love you. And we expect you to be joining us online via Facebook. Amen. I'm going to keep track of you. All right. Love you, sister. Um, and then finally, I'm going to ask the students to come down. If you are our youth to come down, uh, parents want to come down, let's just everybody come on down. Let's pray for, for, our, for our students. You can stand or, or come down either way. But we'll close in prayer. Absolutely pray for the teachers. <laughs> That's daily. I know. <laughs> All right. Let me find my family over here somewhere. There we go. I'm going to stand up behind you. All right. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you right now, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. And Father, I just pray for protection, Father, over our teachers and our, the staff and the students, Father. Father, we know, Father, that the enemy is, is, is at work, Father. And I just pray a hedge of protection around them, Father. I pray you guard, guard their hearts and their minds, Father. Give them the boldness to speak truth, Father. I pray for teachers. I know what they, they come against, Father. And I pray that they stand firm in you, especially, you know, the... Father, as a Christian, Father, it's tough, but being a Christian teacher is even, even tougher, Father. And I pray, Father, that you give them the boldness, Father. Father, that you give them the courage to speak truth into the kids. That is their mission field, the mission field that you've called them to be, Father. And I pray, Father, that they just share your word with those. Let them not be scared or, or afraid to do so, Father. And I pray for our students, Father. Father, I pray you, you protect them again, Father, but also give them a boldness to declare your name, Father. Let them be bold in that, Father. Let them stand firm in your promise, Father. And Father, I pray that, Father, that again, that they just share you through their testimony. And that's oftentimes how they treat people, how they talk to people. And Father, I just pray for a successful year. I pray for your will to be done. I pray you give them wisdom, Father. And I pray for success, as, and I pray for parents, Father. 
I pray you give them peace and comfort knowing you're in control of all things, Father, that although they might not be with them, you are always with them, Father, and before they were ours, they're yours, Father. We thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. With that being said, you are dismissed.